Coming up on the program, we're going to take and utilize our cold frame we made a couple of years ago to help warm the soil and start getting some produce to germinate in the soil. And we're going to transfer this flower bed into a pop-up raised bed so we can grow more vegetables. All that and more coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is sponsored in part by For all your non-GMO, heirloom, organic, vegetable, flowers, and herb seeds, visit dollarseed.com. Sue Growing Supply, located in Wausau, Wisconsin, focusing on certified leaf compost, an excellent amendment for poor soil. With their new garden blend, improving soil structure in clay and sandy soil, great for creating new garden beds. Also available from Sue's, pre-filled trays and pots with professional potting soil mix or organic rice hull based potting soil mix. Bag and bulk of certified leaf compost also available. Visit SueGrowingSupply.com. Don't poison your soil with municipal water. Attach a body, mind, and soil hose and filter. Free shipping exclusively through the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Just click on the body, mind, and soil icon. Authentic Haven brand, soil conditioner for the home gardener. Easy to brew, 100% organic. Visit ManureTea.com. Rain Reserve. Reserving your rain, preserving our future. Rain Reserve, manufacturing of rainwater capturing capabilities. Visit rainreserve.com and use coupon code RAIN2016 to save 10% on your purchase. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. I'm Joy Baird. Though we're in the early portions of spring, the ground is still fairly cold and we want to try to get a jump start. And one way to get a jump start on growing in the ground is using a cold frame. Now you can purchase a cold frame or you can make one out of a billion and a half different items that you might have laying around your house or minimal expense from your local home and garden center or hardware store. This was all made from reclaimed lumber. The only expense was plastic. This is a four mil plastic that we use. Now it's not, compl it's not see through but it allows enough light to get through to germinate the seeds. We attempted to germinate seeds and grow in the winter a couple of years ago and we failed miserably at it because we started the seeds far too late in the year. The ideal and concept of growing in the winter is growing established plants and keeping them alive, not trying to get them to reach a mature state. We're in the spring now. The soil is still cold. We need soil to be a minimum 40 to 60 degrees for a, a lot of our cool weather crops. Now we're going to grow a couple of different varieties here. We're going to grow some lettuce, some spinach, some arugula, some cilantro. Now we could also grow parsnips and or carrots in this cold frame. We're choosing not to do that because we want to uh, utilize other areas of the garden for a lot of those, a lot of those uh, carrots and, and parsnips. So there's a couple other places in the garden we want to put them. These here, cilantro, arugula, lettuce, well, let, let's go over these. Spinach and lettuce will take about 40 to 60 days to reach maturity. Arugula will take 30 days. And arugula, for those who may not be familiar, it is a green that has a peppery taste to it whenever you eat it. As well as cilantro will take about that 40 to 60 day range as well. We decided to put it, the cold frame in this area of the garden for a couple of reasons. Now, wherever you put your cold frame, you want to keep a couple things in mind. Where is the sun at relevant to the cold frame itself? Because you're wanting the sun to warm the internal portions and heat up the soil. If you're still in an area where the soil is extremely cold or if not frozen, and you have the availability to have a cold frame, you want to set your cold frame on an area where you're intending to plant about two weeks prior to planting. That will ensure the soil will warm to an adequate temperature to plant those seeds and get those to germinate properly. Another thing you want to keep in mind is whenever you are building or using a cold frame, it gets very hot in a cold frame. 
Just because the ambient temperature may be 50 degrees outside, that doesn't mean that it's 50 degrees inside the cold frame. Inside the cold frame can be everywhere from 80 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and those little seedlings will cook themselves, and all the work you've put into it will then be extinguished. So you want to be cautious of that and, and aware of the forecast so you can know if you need to vent this during the daytime. If it's 60 degrees outside, yes, absolutely, in our instance, we will vent this. But if it's only 30 degrees outside with a nighttime temperature of, let's say, 20, we'll keep this closed almost all the time. Now, the only time you want to open this in times of extreme cold is during peak hours of the day when the sun can have plenty of time to rewarm the internal portions and the air inside of it. So planting this is really no different than planting a traditional ground garden or containers. I'll lay that there. The thing you want to keep in mind is, and, and we've made this out of straw bales, this is a 2 by 10 reclaimed lumber here, is you want to, one, in our instance, we worked the soil, got all the weeds out of it, and then we also made sure that this was all nestled in the soil so there would be no uh, opportunity for air to seep up underneath. We also have this gasket of other uh, leftover plastic just to add more of a seal to it. Obviously, we're not nearly as concerned of keeping the Arctic cold out of this due to the fact that it is springtime. Now, if it was later in the fall, then we would really go an extra mile to ensure that the internal portions of this cold frame was kept warm. This is also an opportunity for the techie people who want to really itemize and look at how outside temperature versus internal temperature of the cold frame, how it affects, and you can have a thermometer. You can put a remote thermometer here and you can see if it's how much it is inside versus outside. So that's something else that uh, you can play around with. And with our leaves, we can also just put around for more insulation. So realistically, it's very easy to plant and you want to put this in a place where it's not going to affect in 60 or 70 days uh, the other plans that you have for your garden. That's why we decided to put it where we did. And you want to plant these, as I said, just identical to how you would in a traditional ground garden raised bed, spacing's the same, and it really is uh, quite easy to do. So I'm just going to go ahead and plant this, and then uh, we'll come back and we'll cover it all up. All right, so I got it all planted. What I've done was I did three rows of, which it doesn't matter to you, I'm just telling you, we did three rows of radishes, uh, French, French breakfast, that was something that we added, uh, a couple rows of arugula, spinach a couple rows, one row of cilantro, or two rows of cilantro, one row of cilantro, two rows of spinach, and some leaf lettuce. And I'm just gonna pick up our seed packets and I'm just gonna gently cover it in. Now, the radishes will germinate about, uh, well, all this will germinate seven, 10 days because it will be warm in this cold frame. Radishes will be the first to come out in about 25 to 32 days. Then the arugula and then the uh, lettuce and spinach and cilantro will come out. Now, the question will be asked, what else could I, could I make a cold frame for tomatoes or, or peppers or squash. You certainly could. Those are called low tunnels or tunnel uh, greenhouses. Now, certain people will try to do winter sowing, and that is a method of where you take all types of seeds, cool weather and warm weather, and start them in milk jugs outside during the frigid temperatures of winter, and they'll germinate. It's a process, and it's, uh, it, it's not for everybody, but it certainly is something that uh, should be looked into if you would like to, uh, to try that. Now, a low tunnel or is a tunnel that is low. It's, you know, a foot, two foot high. Now, you could start, you could put your transplants of your warm weather crops in it. Now, one thing I would greatly caution you with is by doing that too early, and you can also like do green beans too early in the season, you're not going to be able to keep the intensity, that heat that those plants want in that tunnel. By not having the adequate temperatures of that 55 degree soil temperature, for example, for tomatoes and about 60 for peppers, by not having that consistency and that atmosphere of warmth, you're going to stunt the plants and put them in, uh, and stunt them and hurt them in the longevity of their growing. 
So as eager and as ambitious as we want to be of putting warm weather crops in the garden, unless you have a giant, cool, uh, cool, uh, giant tunnel that you can walk in like a greenhouse, I would really shy away from putting some of those warmer weather crops in the ground earlier than what they should be. Something like this, a cold, uh, cold, uh, low tunnel will work great for broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, anything like that, that it can handle some of that coolness, but it needs just that little bit of warmth to keep it going. So that's our cold frame. We're just gonna close it up. It's gonna be warm the next couple of days. So we just want to vent it slightly so we can get some of that uh, greenhouse effect in there to warm the soil even more than what it is now, but also not to bake the seeds. All right, so this, was an area in the sister-in-law's backyard garden where last fall, early fall, we did lazy gardening. What it was simply meant was we took a bunch of seeds and just broadcast them in this area. We worked the soil. Unlike the large garden where we're going with a, a minimal to no soil disturbance, we did work the soil here and we planted arugula, radishes, peas, any kind of cool weather crop you can think of that would grow very quickly. So they harvested as many as they could and you can see over the winter, it became a mat here that kind of protected the soil. Now in addition to that, what has happened is, let's see if I can find something here. Uh, go back. Like this here, this was a radish that didn't get harvested. And what has happened is it has made a cavern in the soil and it's actually aerating and it's doing two things. It's as this breaks down and the, the soil and microbes eat it up and it compost, you're gonna have a hole there which aerates it as well as allow water to penetrate into the garden, into the soil. So by leaving this and, and not ripping it up at the end of the year, it's allowing the soil to aerate and giving back to the soil for the, the, one, uh, the items that didn't get harvested. So we're gonna take this flower bed here. I think they're dailies, don't really know, not a flower person, but we're going to transform it into a raised garden bed using the grow bags here. Obviously flowers, these particular ones, I think they're daylilies, are not edible. So that really doesn't serve us a lot of purpose. Uh, true enough, we need the flowers for the bees, but also we have flowers in other locations. So we're gonna take this area and take the flowers out and use these Root Trapper 2 giant grow bags. Now, the purpose of these were actually designed for developing tree roots. They would put trees in these and they would sell them to, and nurseries would use them and they'd sell them to, to customers. But we can take and utilize a 60 gallon grow bag, 15 inches high by 36 inches across, that's three foot, into growing edible vegetables. Now, obviously 15 inches is an incredible height for vegetables so we're not going to use all 15 inches because that would be an excessive amount of extra soil that doesn't need to be used for this application so we're only going to go about nine inches at maximum depth depth we're going to put um, tomatoes peppers we believe we're going to put some beets in these really it's kind of as we go type of thing but we should be able and we will well we will be able to get three three of these grow bags in this area just got to take the uh flowers out, get the soil level, and then uh, we'll put some cardboard down, but we get all to that, we'll get all to that uh, momentarily. So I wanna get these flowers out, and then we're gonna bring some of the compost that we've got in our compost pile, and put at the bottom for a base, and then we'll bring the Sioux, uh, Sioux Growing Supplies uh, certified leaf compost and fill the top. The reason for that is, Sioux Growing Supplies, they create their compost and they heat it, it's a heated compost. Ours is not necessarily heated compost, which means that there are still some viable weed seeds in that compost. It's still good compost, but we're gonna take that and put it in the bottom third of these bags and then put the good, com or put the, the good compost on top that we know have no weed seeds on it, just to stretch our compost and uh, fill the bags up. So I gotta get these uh, flowers out of the way, get this ground level, and then we'll get these bags located and put some soil, good get some compost in them. All right, so I got the ground level for two of them. We're holding off just for a little bit here on the third one because we have daylilies there, but we believe those are irises and I'm not sure if we want to get rid of those or not. But we can get these two here, these two grow bags here ready to go. What I've done, we leveled the ground, took the flowers and the roots, sifted them with our sifter here, 
got all loose particles, all good soil out of it, and then got rid of the, the roots. Now what I'm going to do here, uh, just a precautionary measure, is I'm going to take these cardboard boxes, break them down, and lay them flat underneath. So just kind of like you would with a raised bed, suppressing, just so we can suppress the weeds, and then this will break down. And because of the porous, of the holes, or the, the netting in the bottom of this, the microorganisms can enter in and out of the grow bag. It won't be just like a, a plastic container where nothing can penetrate it. So I'm just going to take and break these down. You can leave the tape on, you can take tape off, personal preference. I don't see that it makes a difference. Uh, and I'm wanting to cover just the area that's going to be, that the grow bag is going to be sitting on top of. So I'm going to have to do some artsy crafty work. Well, here's what I can do. I can take and split this. Double it on part of it. There we go. Now there's going to be some areas here on the edge that's not going to get covered very well just because I don't have a circular piece of cardboard, but I'm going to cover as much as I can. So put that there. So I've got it fairly covered here. What I can do is I can take, trim that off a little bit. Nothing has to be pretty here, it just has to be functional. Put right there and cover that up. All right, so now what I'm gonna do, and I'll do the same for the next one, I will take some of the soil here that we got from the removal of the flowers and the leveling process, and I'll put it in the bottom of here just to get the framework done on both of them, and then uh, we'll get some of the compost and we'll see where we're at on that process. So this is really finely sifted soil here that I'm just using as a base just to kind of get a shape of this. You can use whatever type of soil you want. We're just using that as a base and then bringing good compost in on top of it. But I just want to get the structure of this put together first. And then you can kind of see how the shape, how it's going to shape. Looks pretty good, so now I'm gonna do the get the other one, put the cardboard down, and use the rest of that soil, and we'll kind of see where we're at. We'll hold off on the third there uh, for momentarily. So I'll get that one, this next one done. All right, now. so we sifted some of our compost from our compost pile. Got it nice, a nice uh, mixture. Only did a little bit. This is obviously, there's some work that goes into it, but after you get the initial structure and compost filled with this, It'll be good for several years. Now, the question's always asked, well, what should I do next year? Should I dump this stuff out and start over? Not necessarily, especially with a, a grow bag this size. You, the larger the size of the grow bag, the more material that's inside of it, the more microbial life that's in the soil, the more it can kind of become its own ecosystem. Obviously, you, you might want to add some organic fertilizer, uh, top it off with some more compost, that type of uh, uh, thought process. But you don't have to dump this out and start over. Now, if you had a one gallon grow bag with a very minimal amount of soil uh, um, amount in it, yeah, go ahead and dump it out. It's very easy to refill it. Something of this nature where you have seven, eight, nine cubic feet of soil, you don't have to do it. And, and the, uh, uh, also the benefit of having these, you have that netting at the bottom where once the cardboard breaks down, you'll have microscopic and microbial life going in and out of the grow bag from the bottom. So we'll get some more soil put in these, get this all done so when the time comes for planting in a few weeks, we'll be ready to utilize another area in our garden that once was not able to grow vegetables. Thanks for watching. Join us again next time for more organic gardening and food preserving. I'm Joy Baird and this has been the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. For more information, please visit the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com.